I have the pleasure to introduce Dr. Landoffy, who is my boss, my coworker, my friend. Dr. Landoffy is uh, director of neuro neuro neurology here at JFK um, Neuroscience Institute. He's also a man of many hats. He is the medical director of neuro-oncology and the Gamma Knife Center here at our JFK Brain Tumor Center. And he is also the medical director of neuro-oncology at the Meridian Health Systems in Neptune, Riverview is in Red Bank. Five There's five hospital systems. <laughs> so without further ado, Dr. Landolfi. Hi, everybody. So um, I'm going to try not to answer my phone if it goes off. I'm, I'm, I'm working across the street today, so if I, if I get disrupted, I apologize. Uh, I'm going to just give a brief background on some of the gliomas. Uh, the title is Adult Brain Tumors, but Al actually asked me to talk about some of the trials uh, that we're involved in and were involved in at JFK. Uh, and then I'll, in, in, intermittently in there, I'll talk about some of the new data that's come out. Um, I do have something about the molecular markers, but I'm really going to leave that for Dr. Uh, Zagzag. All right. So gliomas are, are four grades. The grade one typically is now for the juvenile pilocytic astrocytoma. Grade two is the diffuse low-grade astrocytoma. And then as we start to get more aggressive and there are more pathological features of concern for us, we start moving into the uh, grade three, the anaplastics, and the grade four, the glioblastoma. So I, I always like to include low-grade gliomas. It's, it's been an area of controversy. It's just a couple of slides in case anybody suffers from those. These are typically non-enhancing tumors. Uh, they're best seen on certain MRI images that we call T2 or flare. Um, the, the treatments historically have been observation, biopsy, debulking, resection. Uh, there are now NCCN guidelines um, for when we utilize uh, adjuvant treatment like radiotherapy and chemo. Uh, historically, for me, if somebody was over the age of 40, I would give them adjuvant radiotherapy uh, under the age of 40 if there were some concerning features. Um, some of the features up there uh, indicating high risk factors are directly from the uh, 2013 NCCN guidelines that we now have. For me, uh, in addition to those guidelines, a uh, high mitotic index uh, or a high growth rate, and somebody with refractory seizure uh, failing multiple meds may be another indication for adjuvant treatment. Again, I'm not going to really talk about the IDH1 just to say that they seem to be an early marker. We look for uh, mutations in the IDH1 which depending on the low-grade glioma type, there's a, and the paper you read, there's varying percentages of, of the positivity. And this is typically what the uh, low-grade gliomas look like. Uh, this is a flare image, non-enhancing tumor. As we get into the more aggressive tumors, we have the glioblastoma uh, seen just in the fifth and sixth decade of life or beyond. Um, EGFR V3 is a molecular marker that we see on these tumors. Uh, and the reason I put it up there, and we'll talk about it later, because it is important, particularly with the, uh, the CELDEX trials. Anaplastic astrocytomas happened about a decade earlier, and then anaplastic oligodendrogliomas. So uh, initially, uh, Greg Current Cross, uh, 1P19Q toe deletions uh, were identified as a fingerprint, a genetic fingerprint for the anaplastic oligodendroglioma. There are uh, two studies. Um, that have really updated data. The studies were originally in uh, 2009, I think, and now there was some updated study uh, material showing that for patients treated with radiotherapy and PCV chemotherapy, and I will acknowledge that I no longer use PCV chemotherapy, uh, in co-deleted 1P19Q patients with anaplastic oligodendrogliomas, they had a survival benefit. It wasn't seen at year one or two, but it was seen after year three. Um, the question really is, Timidar or PCV. Again, I don't use uh, PCV. I haven't used PCV in a very long time. Um, I, I prefer Timidar, one drug versus three. Um, there's some retrospective data from uh, Andy Lassman, who's now at uh, Columbia, showing a benefit in, in those patients getting uh, Timidar versus the PCV. There is an ongoing trial called CODEL uh, that they're likely to redesign uh, to answer this question. It was halted when the uh, other updated data came out. Molecular markers that we typically look at, these are just a few. There are many that we test on the neuropathological tissue. 
Uh, methylation of MGMT. MGMT is a promoter gene, sort of the little repair guys that come out and fix the damage that the radiation and the chemo does. So we look at MGMT status, um, 1P19 co-deletions, and IDH1. And, and, and Dr. Zagzag is going to get into that, so I really don't want to talk too much about it. Typical appearance, uh, this can be a, uh, an anaplastic oligodendroglioma, a glioblastoma, or an astrocytoma. Typical appearance, contrast enhancing, mass effect. So what treatments do we have? Um, obviously, I just showed you imaging modalities, and we do utilize uh, functional and DTI imaging, MR spectroscopy, um, although I think MR spectroscopy for certain uh, non-specialists in the field of neuroonc is overutilized. I think you've got to be very careful when you order the, that test and you think it, you're going to hang your hat on the uh, interpretation. But we have uh, surgery, as uh, Dr. Brem eloquently uh, explained to us. We have radiotherapy, chemotherapies, and clinical trials. Surgery is very important. We know that when there's a greater than 98% removal, uh, we consider that a gross total resection, and that confers a survival benefit. Uh, the survival benefit actually starts to occur at about 88% uh, of resection of the tumor, uh, but in increasingly goes up to a significant amount when we get to 98%. Chemotherapy, I think the chemotherapy most widely used uh, is Timidar. It's both used for newly diagnosed glioblastoma, both with radiotherapy and, in addition, uh, monthly cycles. Uh, the standard protocol is six monthly cycles, but I have to tell you, uh, my preference is 12, others' preferences are nine, I've seen people do 18. We don't know if any of the monthly cycles really make a difference, because that's not how the study was designed. Um, but but we, all, we all utilize it for the most part, unless there's some adverse events that make us want to stop it sooner. It's also proof for recurrent anaplastic astrocytoma. What you don't see up there is oligodendroglioma, and uh, PCV is actually a uh, a treatment for that. Again, I use Timidar, um, and I'm able to get it approved through the insurances by sort of using what we call ICD-9 codes, although I got to tell you the insurance companies are getting more savvy now. They send us a list with actually individual diagnoses, and you're supposed to check it off. Um, all right. So this is the STOOP data. This is uh, radiation and timazolamide uh, concurrently has improved survival in these patients. Uh, average is 14.6 uh, months, but it does vary if you're over the age of 55 or under the age of 55 compared to radiotherapy alone. More importantly, the five-year data that came out, uh, you were three times more likely to be alive if you received radiation and chemotherapy uh, for your glioblastoma than radiotherapy alone uh, at five years. So that's important, there, uh, important uh, information. So what are our approved therapies for glioblastoma? And I use these therapies interchangeably for anaplastic astrocytomas and oligodendrogliomas as well. Uh, Timidar, which you're all familiar with, BCNU, which has been around for a very long time. It's a nitrosuria chemotherapy. Avastin, uh, approved for recurrent glioblastoma. Uh, people have used it for newly diagnosed. I am not one of those uh, neuro-oncologists that have used Avastin up front. When I have used it up front, is, it has been for large tumors that are not resectable, causing neurological deficits in the hopes of really, uh, really causing a significant decrease in, in mass effect uh, and edema. Um, outside of that, I haven't used it up front because uh, I wasn't convinced that there would be uh, a survival benefit despite uh, some of the retrospective papers uh, from Dr. Gruber that did show a survival benefit and others that showed progression-free survival benefit. The, the Avaglio trial and the RTOG uh, 0825 were presented at ASCO. Uh, basically, both of them did show uh, a progression-free survival benefit, uh, and the numbers were very similar, 10 and 6, 10 and 7, so uh, I'm sure that's real. Um, but there was no overall survival benefit uh, between the two studies. There uh, were some differences in the study. The RTOG study started the uh, Avastin four weeks into the radiotherapy, uh, as opposed to what most people do, which is at the onset of chemoradiotherapy. In addition, uh, quality of life. The Avaglio uh, showed, um, I don't want to say improvement, I would say that in the, bev in the Bevacizumab, the Avastin arm, there was less of a deterioration in the health quality of life questionnaire, where the RTOG felt that there was a decrease in quality of life. 
Um, but that data, that specific data for, for quality of life is still being looked at. They haven't completed the analysis. And it wasn't a primary endpoint uh, for one of those studies. And so you have to take that with a grain of salt. For me, I don't use Avastin up front, except in the situation that I described. Uh, I was a part of an advisory board uh, meeting, I think two months ago in Chicago, uh, where we discussed all of the new data around uh, Avastin. And I would say from a neuro-oncology perspective, a medical neuro-oncology perspective, most of us will not be using Avastin up front. There's Gliadel, which uh, Dr. Uh, Brent talked to you about. I actually like Gliadel. Uh, I think there's a utility for it. I think there's a utility for it in brain metastasis as well. I think that it makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to be very interested uh, in seeing that data. And then the Novacure system, uh, approved recently for recurrent glioblastoma. The specific FDA approval was that based on the retrospective trial, uh, which I, I mean the recurrent disease trial, which I was a part of, um, it was as good as the next standard of care. And that next standard of care included any drug that the physician wanted to use, uh, including just observation. I'm going to talk a little bit about the Novacure system because although it's approved as a monotherapy, uh, I don't use it that way. Uh, and the company knows that I don't use it that way. And there's, a, for me, a very logical reason why that is, and I'll explain that later. Clinical trials. So although I was not involved in the selinginotide uh, trial, I think it's important. Uh, this was looking to be pretty promising. Uh, Dr. Reardon uh, had a very nice study, and then uh, neighbor had a study with uh, the run-in, uh, and it seemed to be well tolerated, and it appeared that it may have a survival benefit, particularly for the methylated MGMT patients. But in the end, on the phase three trials, uh, there was no survival benefit. Uh, and I can tell you just from discussion among all of us that this drug is probably what I would consider abandoned at this point. It may come up again, uh, but at this point it's abandoned. ICT-107, um, we actually opened up the trial here at JFK um, for the country. I was very happy to be a part of it. The vaccine was made at UPenn. Um, we utilized not tissue like they do for the DC vax, but they take the patient's blood. Uh, through apheresis. We send it down to UPenn. UPenn would then uh, what we call pulse the uh, patient's immune cells with markers or proteins that are found on the glioblastoma cells. We would then get the vaccine back from UPenn and we would utilize it during the standard of care of treatment. This trial closed in August of 2012 uh, and they are still analyzing the data. And this is basically just showing you a representation of, of what occurs. Interestingly enough, and uh, all the physicians in the room will tell you, never use phase one data <laughs> to look at survival. But um, they did. And on their phase one data, which I was not a part of, uh, at two years, there was an 80% survival benefit. Okay, two, at two years, 80% of people were alive compared to 26% for the stoop data, and that was all patients, because if you pulled the methylated MGMT patients out of the stoop data, their two-year survival was 50%. So I, I, I felt this was intriguing enough, even though I don't like using phase one data to look at survival, to, um, to be involved in the study. So basically what we did was we're targeting cancer stem cells um, using immature immune cells to inject the patient with the vaccine to stimulate their immune system to attack the proteins on the glioblastoma. <clears throat> right now, uh, there's a pilot study going on at Cedars-Sinai in Los Angeles for a new compound from immunocellular called ICT-121. And this is gonna be for recurrent glioblastoma. Uh, we are involved in uh, the ACT-4 and REACT trials here. Um, this is a vaccine that is considered an off-the-shelf vaccine uh, against EGFR-V3. Uh, EGFR-V3 um, is found in about 31% of primary glioblastoma patients. Uh, the, oh, which trial is it that they're doing? Um, the, the Celdex trial is also looking at tissue. So in order to get on the trial, the tumor has to be EGFR-V3 positive. So they're actually collecting all that tissue uh, and so far, for their own data, it's pretty consistent that it's about 30% uh, that are positive. 
tocogen. Uh, tocogen is a gene therapy trial uh, that we're involved in here. Uh, there are two arms to the study. Uh, one arm is an intratumoral arm where uh, the virus, and I'll discuss a little bit about the, uh, the way it's done, is injected into a non-resectable tumor uh, through an MRI infusion that can take anywhere between an hour and two, depending on the facility. And then there's a resection arm where the tumor is resected and this virus is injected in the surrounding tissue. Uh, we're involved in the resection arm. I believe Hackensack uh, in northern New Jersey has just become part of the intratumoral arm. It's the only uh, two uh, facilities in the northeast where uh, tocogen is available. Um, basically, there's a retrovirus that was genetically altered that carries a little gene, and they, they attach that gene to the viral replicating mechanism. We inject the tumor, I mean the vaccine or virus into the surrounding tissue, and the virus infects the glioma, the glioblastoma cells, but does not affect the normal brain cells. It incorporates that gene to make a protein called cytosine, D, an enzyme called cytosine deaminase, which basically converts pills called 5-FC, which is an antiviral agent, been around for decades, although it's a special formulation they use, uh, into chemotherapy, 5-FU, within the tumor cells. And on the original trial, and there's been a lot of modifications with regards to dosing of the virus and dosing of the 5-FC, uh, you were only allowed to be on it for six months. So uh, through a lot of meetings, uh, if somebody responds to the, to the treatment, uh, we felt it was important enough that they should be able to continue on. So now there's a continuation study. So if somebody responds to the treatment, they're at six months, they can switch over the continuation study, and they can get the 5-FC indefinitely until further progression. And, and this is basically it. The virus is injected into tumor. Uh, it spreads through uh, the tumor, and the hope is that it would cause tumor regression. This is um, the virus labeled with the protein that we can identify in stain called anti-GAD, showing that the virus is spreading from the area of injection uh, and beyond. It was a phase one escalating trial, meaning they were trying different doses of the virus. Uh, right now, they're at the, uh, the, the maximum dose of the virus, and now what they're adjusting is the 5-FC. There's a lot of blood work and labs that are done uh, to help us determine what levels we want in the serum. And this is just the, uh, the schematic. Nova TTF. Uh, Nova TTF is another trial uh, that we're involved in. Uh, we were involved in the recurrent trial, and now we're involved in the newly diagnosed trial, newly diagnosed glioblastoma. Um, the trials that we've talked about, Celdex, uh, ICT-107, the Novacure, are for glioblastoma specifically. Uh, the beauty of the tokogen trial, it's for any recurrent malignant glioma, which I like. More people, the better. The, um, when Novacure, and we have Novacure represented back here. Hello, Mariana. Hi. When Novacure contacted me, uh, and this has got to be going back, I don't know, eight years ago or more, um, I was very skeptical um, to the point where I required the company to come in, and at the time the president of the company did come in, to show me all of their data, uh, basic science data and any pilot data that they had. Um, I like novel therapies. Uh, I think that that's, when we start thinking outside the box, I think that we're, we're taking more things into consideration and we may be able to start combating this disease. So after hearing um, and seeing all of their data, I was intrigued enough to want to be involved in the trial. So we were involved in the recurrent disease trial. That data has been published. Uh, basically, the patient wears a raise on the scalp. Their head needs to be shaved twice a week. And what it does, and they carry it around a backpack. They actually have it now. It's a nice, well-contained little backpack. Eventually, the batteries that the patient has to carry, which are a little bulky now, maybe the size of a, a book, uh, are going to be the size of an iPad. And they go about, they wear it. Um, as much as, as often as possible, it's, you really want to be on it 75% of the time, uh, otherwise it won't have a benefit, a clinically significant benefit. I have patients who will go to work because uh, people don't know that they have a brain tumor there, uh, and will put it on immediately when they get home from work, and they're still able to make that 75% uh, compliance. 
And this is basically the arrays. I know that they're out in the, uh, in the hallway as well and the battery pack that they carry. I'm not going to get into the science too much. Uh, a, a good colleague of mine and friend, um, Eric Wong, uh, up at uh, Deaconess in Boston, is really delving more into the mechanism. But basically, the device sends a low-level electrical current, and it alternates the current. And the arrays are front and back, side to side. And what it is is everything in the body uh, is pretty much polarized. All the cells in the body are polarized. When cells divide, there's a polarization. They get pulled apart. And the device is trying to disrupt that, disrupt the cells from pulling apart and disrupt the organelles and the DNA from, from pulling apart. So uh, on the left side of the screen is normal cell division, uh, and on the right side of the screen is the field effects, disrupting that mitosis. Basically, uh, just what I said, it works on the, okay. On the top, you'll see normal cell division, one cell becoming two, dividing, and then you'll see two examples of the fields where they disrupt the tumor cells. Does it work for all the cells? No, because um, the electrical field has to get across the cell uh, at a particular angle to really be the most effective. And unfortunately, our bodies don't work that way. There's just not two sides. Things are up and down, side to side, front to back. This is uh, some examples from the pilot trial. Okay, after six months, they saw a reduction uh, in the tumor. They saw some regression here. On this particular slide, I also think there's reduction in the operative cavity. That makes things look different. So it's approved for recurrent glioblastoma as a monotherapy. But the idea behind the device is that it takes time for it to really have an effect. So based on all the data that they've had to date, the tumor actually starts to get bigger before it starts to stabilize and get smaller. So for me, as a neuro-oncologist, having the tumor grow at all is unacceptable. So I don't use it as a monotherapy. If somebody has recurrent glioblastoma, I, I will offer the device um, and I switch chemotherapy. The idea is that the chemotherapy will work immediately and in those however many months, you know, some therapies like carboplatin, if you choose to use that, really only uh, have a, an average effect for about three months and then the device has more of an opportunity to work. So that's the rationale behind why I don't use it alone, despite its approval. Um, the, the device is commercially available uh, for other tumor types. Uh, you know, once something's commercially available, we can use it for whatever we want. So we can use it for other tumor types. Uh, the trial now is for newly diagnosed glioblastoma, and it's basically the standard of care with or without the device. There is a new low-grade glioma trial that's coming out of the Cleveland Clinic that we will be a part of here. Um, I've said yes, but we're not going full force yet because I really want to see the study design because I'm a little concerned about what the, <laughs> what the actual markers are going to be for telling if it's working uh, for a low-grade glioma, which can be stable for many years. Um, and there's a meningioma trial that's going to be coming out of Memorial uh, Sloan Kettering for malignant meningiomas. Um, I'm just about done because I speak fast and I have to go around. You know, when you're Italian and from New Jersey, you just want to get it all out. Um, we have, I'm not sure if everybody's familiar, there's a commission on cancer that goes around and certifies cancer centers. Um, it's a national organization, they work through JCO, um, and they basically certify centers. And what you try to do is you try to get certified for a certain number of years and you try to get accommodations. It's, it's, it's considered important, although I tell you I think it's less important than what the work individual people do. They were here and they certified the cancer program um, probably a few months ago. Um, Neuro-oncology is a part of that program. And what the, uh, the representative from the organization did was she came to me separately and provided me with some data uh, that I did not seek out and did not have. Um, so I just wanted to share it with everybody because uh, I think it's very important um, that you have a multidisciplinary team to take care of these patients. Uh, I think neurosurgery, neuropathology, and I'll, I'll show you the list of people that we have involved here, uh, is very important if you're going to give the optimal care. And I think that's been shown with even ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, multidisciplinary care makes a difference for survival. This is the uh, survival data 
for non-metastatic disease and non-malignant men uh, meningiomas. So these are malignant brain tumors, gliomas. This is the JFK survival data on the bottom and the national survival data on the top. And for each year, one, two, three, four, and five, the overall survival here at JFK is higher than the national average. The five-year survival is 34.5% here, and the national average is 21.7%. And you can see that on this graph, JFK being on the right. It's not about JFK. Uh, it's not about UPenn or Memorial. It's about the individual people working together to bring their minds together and the advisory boards that we travel to around the country when we meet with our colleagues and we get information from them that allows us to carry that information back to our patients so that we can have this kind of outcome. And that's what I think is most important. And this is the multidisciplinary team. It involves everybody, neuro-oncology, neurosurgery, neurology, radiation oncology, medical oncologists, neuropathology, uh, our nurses, our nurse navigators, physical therapy, hospice and support service, all a part of the team. Okay, This is the kind of team that you want taking care of your tumor, and these are available at reputable institutions around the country. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Do we have, I don't, might not have the mic. That's all right. Um, I wondered on your last list why there were no nutritionists listed. That's, that's a very important point. Nutrition is a very important point. I actually, uh, we have a nutrition team that meets with them, and that's a mistake on my part for not just including them on the list. But yeah, absolutely, they're an important part of everything. So can I ask you what they're focusing on? Well, I will tell you that the nutritionists, for me, uh, focus on helping the patients balance uh, their, their dietary intake. So. I'm not somebody who agrees with everything that Gene Wallace, who I have a lot of respect for, believes in. Uh, for the patients that I take care of, I really want them to maintain the quality of life. So if somebody likes to have a big family, they can't have any concerns. I want them to have a big family. So uh, for me, it's a balance between good nutrition, exercise, uh, positive attitude, I think, goes a long way. Uh, but maintaining things that people enjoy. You know, I a, my father recently passed away at Grossman Street back in March. Uh, arguments that we would have about nutrition. He was obese, he was an alcoholic. Um, just couldn't get him to do the right things. But one thing I have to say, you know, he's got He loved his life. He lived a great life. He was happy. He was fulfilling. He got to see his grandkids. So I have no regrets, although we looked at him around, you know, for the day he won't. Yep, so um, all patients have a choice about what they want to do in terms of exercise, or nutrition, or other life practice. The question is, would your team provide the kind of support and information that allow patients to make intelligent choices about it? Yes, I, I believe so. I have patients uh, from all over. Some who choose not to have chemotherapy, not to have radiation. I mean, I agree with the decisions that they make, but I absolutely respect the decisions that they make. I always understand what it could mean for them. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take care of them and definitely provide them information and support. I was just wondering about your opinion on complementary therapies such as naturopathy, um, uh, exercise, mindful activities, yoga, um, all that sort. Um, and I'm particularly interested in knowing about whether you recommend for or against certain um, introductions by other doctors or practitioners of um, uh, supplements that could perhaps contravene what you're trying to do. So
So with regards to supplements, uh, I just asked, I had no problem with supplements, I'm a very open-minded guy. Um, I just asked that I know what the supplements are, um, although I don't look at it, I've been around for a long time. And uh, I've seen supplements cause some problems. There was a patient of mine who was uh, taking a Japanese uh, oil wine and uh, it caused significant thrombocytopenia. I had a study that was directly related to what they were taking. So as long as I know what it is, and I know that it's not going to interfere with the therapy uh, that I believe is going to be most helpful, uh, and it's not going to cause adverse events, which affects quality of life and hospitalizations and other issues, then I'm okay with uh, supplements. Patty and I, uh, Patty's here, which is probably in the room, my, my neurology nurse. Uh, when people ask me about natural supplements, I, I talk to them a little bit about root of six and calcitonin. Uh, because at least then the engine had looked at it and there was some anti glioma activity. So if they really are interested in the natural supplement, I kind of pushed them in that direction because I think that's at least something that, that I can wrap my mind around. As far as yoga and healthy living and reiki therapy and everything, I fully support that. In fact, I tell my patients when they ask me about these things, if it makes you feel better to run naked through the woods, then run naked through the woods. <laughs> Dr. Landolfi, hi. Um, oh. Hi. It's um, me. I just, one recommendation for your team. Yeah. Would you please add a social worker to that team? Yeah. Social worker? We, uh, we use the social workers through JFK and through hospice. Mm. Uh, we don't have, the bottom line is we don't have the income. The funds, because mm. they're really a neuro, a specialist would be able to be great on your team. Yeah. So yeah, the institute does not have the income to fund the mm -hmm. social worker, but we utilize the social workers through the hospital uh, and through the hospice service. Okay. And the doctor, first I thought it was great. It was a nice function, but um, I don't know, ICT 107, or even Yeah. Yeah, I thought it was a great talk and uh, a sweeping lecture. On ICT-107, we're very excited at Penn because one, we believe in immunotherapy, and two, uh, we prepare the vaccine at Penn. Just a, a caveat, when you get 80%, um, I mean, wonderful survival data, think these criteria, phase one, that trial and some of the other immunotherapy trials require gross total removal. So two things, one, as you said yourself, those patients do better just from the strength of the surgery, which I know is something that we emphasize. And two, it's also picking, selecting tumors that, so I think the Stoop trial, you're comparing apples to oranges, because the Stoop trial compares, takes all the glioblastomas. Here we're taking ones that are very receptive, nice round ones. You know. And we can enjoy appropriate Right, so that may be, that may always account for that Gartner curve that we're, we think, wow, we've got it. And uh, so we have to, we have to, you know, react the way you did. I mean, be very excited about it. But we also have to. So one of the things Donna Rourke is doing with Carl June for the new CAR technology is they're going to go the other way, which is going to take the most, uh, the the worst prognosis. So if you get a signal, it's very significant. If you don't get a signal, there might be explanations. They're going to. So it's it's always a question in trial design. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a very good point. ICT one seven. Uh, that yes. So what's happening now? Like, they're analyzing. They're analyzing. So how long does that take? Well, it, it depends on um, one the amount of data, and they also look for and control arm um, the patient survival for the year. So it was closed in August, of, so it's just a little over a year. So you want me to do a little Dean Martin? No, a little Dean Martin. Can't sing like. <laughs> um, yeah, it takes a while to, to analyze the the data, but I'm hopeful about it, you know. And the fact that they move forward with another uh, vaccine, at least in a pilot study at Cedar Sinai, the 121, uh, which we'll probably be involved in as well. Um, you know, I'm excited about that. I, I think the treatment should be multimodality. I'm excited about immunotherapies. I'm excited about gene therapies uh, too. The problem with gene therapies in the past has been the vector uh, getting the, the appropriate gene or marker in. And I think we've come a long way in the last five years of doing that. Uh, 
we, we have uh, a professor who just joined us, uh, our, we have a basic science lab from Harvard whose uh, interest is in uh, vaccine therapies and, uh, and vectors. So, um, you know, we're excited about it. But I think it's multimodality. Uh, I don't think we're ever going to lose conventional chemotherapy. I don't think we're going to lose radiotherapy. I think that's all going to be a part of it. Um, and as we get more and more further into the molecular uh, genetics of things and the neuropathology, um, because this is exciting for the, the, the companies as well, you know, the pharmaceutical companies, uh, as we get these markers, then drugs can be developed to sort of attack those markers. Uh, and in fact, I've been in touch with um, Genentech, who makes a vaccine, um, about doing phase one data, uh, a phase zero data. What I want to do is uh, provide them with brain tumor tissue every time we operate for their basic science labs and let them work on um, other agents to, to try to combat these disease. Uh, as we all say, we're very good about doing things in addition. We're very good about curing mice of disease. It's when we carry into people that we seem to be losing. There is, a, I can't remember his name, and I apologize to him for this. Uh, there's a very nice basic scientist at Johns Hopkins um, who, I'm not somebody who believes in chemotherapy sensitivity testing, at least not the way that it has been done, uh, but he, he's basically taking the tumor tissue out of the patient about a centimeter cube, uh, including the stroma, uh, the support mechanism, and implanting it in a rat, uh, or mice, mouse model, sorry, uh, and mouse model, New York they use rats. Uh, in Los Angeles, he trained, but anyway. Um, so he, he actually tests the various uh, agents against that mouse, uh, and he's had um, right now, and it's going to be published if it hasn't already been published, it's supposed to be the summer in nature, uh, a 90% correlation. And the interesting thing is, and he hasn't done it in tumors yet, he's just starting to look at brain tumors. Uh, pancreatic cancer is where he was most interested in. And he's got a, uh, he's got a four or five year survival of uh, pancreatic cancer uh, using agents that medical oncologists typically don't use for pancreatic cancer. He tested them, uh, the conventional agents didn't work. He started testing some other agents. Uh, it worked uh, in the mouse and it actually worked in the, uh, in the uh, patient as well. So I find that stuff to be very exciting. It goes beyond the scope of my expertise or my knowledge. I'm not a basic scientist and I never wanted to be. Um, just, to, just to put it into context, in college when we had to do experiments uh, and, and tell what kind of you know, uh, sucrose glucose or it was, I did a taste test. I tasted each one and then I figured out which one was mine. Just I wasn't really interested in all that. <laughs> What do you mean by? Do you, do you determine how long the patient should So if somebody's received chemo radiotherapy, the Timidar and the radiation at the same time, I will typically go out 12 months. Um, and not based on any strong data, but some mild data that was out there that seemed to show that 12 months was better than six, but, but not strong data. Um, if I'm happy to get six in, depending on side effects, I'm happy. If somebody hasn't had chemo radiotherapy, um, I'll just give you an example. I have one patient who has uh, a multifocal, um, probably 10, 10 areas of uh, low grade appearing on the MRI, oligodendroglioma, who has had um, eight years of Timidar, four years. She was not treated with chemo radiotherapy. She had four years, and then I followed her for, oh, I don't know, like another five years, and then it started to recur, and I put her back on another four years. She stabilized, and she's been stable since. Uh, where's is Patty here? No, she's not here. I think she's been, it's got to be about 18 years now that she's had that tumor. So I, I don't have a, you know, the NCC and guidelines are very good. I disagree with the brain meds more. I don't like not to follow them after that first year. <laughs> it's a personal preference. But um, the, the, the NCC guidelines are very good. We, we haven't had them before. It's, they've only been around since 2011 was the first. But they're guidelines. And so, and I think the people who wrote them, Jeff Razor, who was a good friend, uh, was part of that. They're guidelines. We, we look to them to, 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 to guide us. I, I don't really look, I mean, I look to them, but it's, it's in here now. 
Um, but it doesn't, there's no arbitrary cutoff for people. We, we do, you know, I, I don't want to say it, but a lot of us fly by the seat of our pants. When, when we get beyond the surgery and the radiation and we're, we're getting into the second and third line therapies or beyond, we're really trying to make the best decision for our patients based on what we know the effect, efficacy of the drugs are, the side effects, quality of life, and then we try to carry that. So you can give me five people and I might treat them five different ways when we get to that point, you know? Oh, I'm sorry, he's got the mic. Apparently the mic is... Uh, in response to the question about social worker and social services, I, I want to thank the Central New Jersey Brain Tumor Support Group for providing that and, and to Patty uh, for referring me to the Center for Head Injuries, uh, which is part of JFK. It's over there on Oak Tree Road, but uh, they have, I'm, I'm a one year, four month brain tumor survivor, can, uh, uh, and the Center for Head Injuries is, has done the world for me, as has the Central New Jersey Brain Tumor Support Group, uh, which all grew out of, your department, and uh, I want to thank you for that. Thank you. If you're not aware of the Center for Head Injuries, uh, they have a whole cognitive rehab department, as well as a, a live-in center, as well as a day center where people come and get all kinds of help. Uh, brain tumor surgery is a head injury. <laughs> a lot of the general public yes. just doesn't always understand that. So. Uh, he wants to give it when you talk about 12 months of Tumidor, is that the five day, 20 five days on 28 days? And yeah. do you start that how soon after you finish radiation chemo? Four weeks. Four weeks. Is yeah, I mean, my standard protocol is four weeks after the end of chemo radiotherapy. I start the monthly Tumidor. It goes between six and 12 months, you know, depending on the patient. Um, if there is progression on that first scan, uh, we have criteria that, that all of us should be aware of called the Rano criteria. I will not call it progressive disease. I'll repeat this. I'll continue the monthly Timidar, but repeat the scan in, in a month and reevaluate. So that could be that. And it depends on where that enhancement is, and um, it makes a difference if somebody's methylated for MGMT as well. Um, they talked about pseudo progression. Is, it, is that what you're suggesting that at that four month or four week point? that it may appear like it has progressed? Yeah, it's not uncommon, and it happens probably about 30% of the time, I would say between 30 and 50% of the time, that um, you'll see new enhancement in the area of the resection cavity or the, the radiation. Uh, for a neuro-oncologist, we are very careful when we see that, and a little bit more diligent in the sense that normally I would wait two months to get a scan, I'll repeat it after a month. Um, I have had, it, you know, you think things are straightforward, but they're not. I mean, I've had somebody who uh, is 42, right frontal tumor, resected twice, been on ICT-107, been on the tocogen. He's about, I don't know, two years out from his initial therapy, and he winds up getting these little contrast-enhancing lesions popping up, uh, all in a straight line to where the radiotherapy was. Uh, nodule, small. I waited it out, they got bigger. Uh, I ordered a PET scan because I thought at that point they were the appropriate size. A PET scan shows us metabolic activity. Uh, it was not, didn't show metabolic activity like we would expect from tumor. Uh, waited it out again um, another month and they all went away. Mm -hmm. And you know, there, there was no change in his therapy. It was off treatment. Um, or no, yeah, there was no change in his therapy. So, you know, that they were probably little demyelinating lesions uh, that develop. Radiotherapy can do a lot of different things. Um, so it's a, it's a matter of just being aware that changes can occur on the MRI scan and not necessarily something that we need to, to worry about or treat, but that's, that's what our job is. Our job is to worry for you and to offer the treatment when we feel it's the most appropriate. Is there any reason why one would wait six weeks as opposed to four? Like, would that be more beneficial, more detrimental? Or? If, um, if a Vastin is used, they may wait, wait longer uh, up front. If Glida wafers are placed, they, they may wait longer. Uh, you know, I have seen various protocols, uh, even on trials. The Celdix trial is one where the timing of the MRI right after the radiotherapy makes absolutely no sense to me. Um, but when you're dealing with large trials that involve uh, multiple countries, you know, things are done a little differently in Europe than in the U.S., that may be why there's a difference. Uh, off the top of my head, I, unless there's some complication from the surgery, I, 
I, I don't know why they would wait six weeks. I have a question. Um, why, why don't you like the um, chemosensitivity um, tests? And also, do you look at the MGMT methylation status before determining how long to keep a person on Timidor? So um, we test uh, MG on site. I have my own neuropathologist. We test uh, MGMT, uh, IDH1, IDH2, 1P9, TPU. We test everything. Um, it does not guide my therapy. Um, I, I think that uh, there's very few of us at this point where it would, would guide our therapy. Uh, it may make us think differently at uh, second line therapy. Uh, but I don't think it changes upfront therapy all that much right now. Uh, as far as the chemotherapy sensitivity testing goes, the, the reason I don't hold a lot of stock in it, and they were big in Colombia, uh, Cassie Balmacita, when she was there, was big on it. Because they, you know, in pet patients, they would test it. It would say, oh, it's going to be responsive to this, but not to that. They give it that. It didn't work. And then they went to the other one, and it said it wouldn't respond to anyway. So it, it's just the way that it was done. Um, that I don't take a lot of stock into it. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a bad idea uh, if it's done uh, in a more appropriate way, actual tumor from the actual patient uh, with all the supporting structures. I like what's being done at Hopkins. Um, so that may, that may change my mind. I don't know if you guys uh, have it, and I'm not, always, I'm not right, you know, this is just one opinion of hundreds of opinions. Do you guys have a, a feel for chemotherapy sensitivity testing? If, Yeah, here. Get the mic. Get the mic. Get the mic. Oh, he just uh, just so he can answer the question, and then I'll get it back. Just saying that I think we can learn a great deal from it, uh, whether or not, as you said, it would have a you know, clinical implication we may to be done. published a paper with Joe Frohoff uh, with Henry Graham and Andy Sloan and myself uh, looking at precision therapeutics, extreme resistance. And it's, we uh, took tissue from the OR and did in vitro assays and looked at what drugs didn't work. And the idea would be uh, to inform medical oncologists what drugs not to use. But there's always this discrepancy. You get a, there's a lot of drugs, like I showed a list of 55 targeted therapies. And there's a large list of drugs that for CNS tumors in the compendium. But practically, it comes down pretty much to timozolomide and something else. And getting oncologists to use that data has been very tough. Today, with all the genomics, with the, micro, with the chips that we have, that uh, the Foundation One in Boston, the, uh, what we're doing, next-gen sequencing, we are collecting a treasure trove of vast information, which is biologically fascinating. But, you know, we, I get data, my patients get data, the exon of the EGF is mutated, and that could, be, that could be the key. But we don't know how to use that information, because it's very hard for our oncologists to, you know, modify a drug or to develop a uh, IRB approved method of using things off label. I mean, I'm sure you've thought about personalized medicine in terms of genetic mutations. Do you have any ideas how we can, as a field, uh, tap into that? I think that... Um, Sounds like a big question. You know, no, <laughs> you know I mean, uh, EGFR, like I've had patients with EGFR positivity where I've used Harceva and it's a fight with the insurance company. Most, you know, I mean, this is the issue that a lot of us have. Uh, I got them to approve it on one of my patients. That would be for amplification, if it's an amplifier. Yeah, the amplifier. And they approved it for two months, and they said, if she responds, we'll continue it. Believing that she would not respond, she responded for 14 months. So they were probably kicking themselves. I, I, uh -huh. I think the, I didn't, uh, I didn't really delve into it, but uh, single um, nuclear polymorphisms. Right. The single nuclear polymorphisms. Um, it's a sort of a, a, a genomic or a genetic way of looking at these tumor types. Um, I think that some recent data has shown a susceptibility uh, for certain people with single uh, nuclear polymorphisms. I don't want to get into the specifics, maybe. 
um, to show uh, risks of uh, certain tumor types. In this case, I think the highest was uh, with the oligodendroglioma. I think it was sort of an 8% increased risk, if I'm not mistaken, from, from the data that was out there. Um, the only, I mean, right now the reality is the only way that I can see sort of combating the obstacles that we have are for uh, the people, um, I'll say at the forefront, because you, you know, when you're, when you're at a, I'm at JFK, and I'm very proud to be there, and I'm very happy with the work that we do, but when you're, when you're at Memorial, let's say, or you're at UPenn, you know, there's a larger name behind that, and I think at my level, I get on phones with medical directors of insurance companies and, and, and pharmaceutical companies. And I have one-to-one -one interactions to try to break down those barriers to kind of get things to the patients. I think more of that needs to be done. Uh, for me, I'm the chairman of the IRB here. I have been for a decade, so it makes it a little easier to get things through uh, if I want to do something uh, off-label. But the bottom line is, if I think it might benefit my patient, I explain that to them. Uh, I'll let them know what I'm doing. It may not be the standard of care, um, but I'm going to do it with IRB approval or not if I don't think it's unsafe for it to be done. So I, I think it's individuals like us pushing and pushing and pushing uh, before we can break down those barriers. And I, I don't know how things are going to change uh, in the um, advent of the Affordable Care Act. I'm hoping it doesn't change. Uh, but that's always, it's always a concern uh, of mine when it's already difficult enough dealing with uh, insurance companies whose bottom line is not patient care. One good news for the brain tumor community is that the Affordable Care Act it will cover clinical trials. Yeah, I think that's, that's amazing. That's amazing. So there are certain things about it that are absolutely public interest. Clinical trial, that's a big deal. Question was on sorry on, on, on Timor, uh, Timodar, What happens in patients who don't tolerate tolerate the Timodar well? Is it nausea? Of course, they are in a higher dose, five days, days. Do you put them on maintenance doses, those smaller doses, or stop the Timodar and put them on Avastin? I know you said you don't like to use Avastin upfront. I will tell you that uh, medical oncologists who choose to treat brain tumor patients, and I'm not going to give my opinion on it, uh, um, tend not to use anti-nausea medication. So when I speak to medical oncologists, the most common side effect that they see from Timidar is nausea and vomiting. I will tell you, we never see nausea and vomiting. If I have one patient in 100 get vomit, um, I increase the anti-nausea pill it resolves. I mean, I can't think of the last time that happened. So, that's probably not a side effect that I would stop therapy for if I, unless I couldn't control it, which has, has not happened to date. Um, but if somebody really is into, in, into, uh, intolerable to a Timidor, and I've had patients, you know, chemotherapy is not without side effects that go beyond bone marrow suppression. And, um, there are neurocognitive effects from chemo. There's fatigue that affect quality of life. If somebody really doesn't tolerate it, uh, I stop it. So I'll do the chemo radiotherapy. So it depends on where you mean, where in the point of treatment. But if I get through chemo radiotherapy and I can't get them to monthly cycles, I'll follow them with nothing every two months. Uh, because the study wasn't, you know, there, there's been a lot of critical papers about uh, the protocol, the soup protocol we use, that the study wasn't really designed to look at the monthly Timidar. So nobody really knows what it does or, or what benefit it has or how much should be used, which is why you have people doing all kinds of different things. Uh, and nobody's wrong. So I would follow them um, with just uh, MRI scans, and then if there's recurrence, uh, I may consider utilizing Timidar if I think I can get them to tolerate it, perhaps at a lower dose, I've done that. I might choose to use a I might choose to use CCNU. It just, it just depends on the patient, the tumor, the, their overall clinical status, uh, and what it looks like surgery. You know, I'm not a one, sur I'm not a neurosurgeon, I'm a neuro-oncologist, but I'm not a one surgery kind of guy. I really like, surgery for, for maximum tumor debulking, and I've had patients who have gotten multiple surgeries and, uh, when I feel it's appropriate to do. And my surgeon agrees with me. 
I actually have to go around.